Um, my name is Bronwyn Rolf. I'm with Kennedy Jenks, but I'm really here to introduce Dwayne. Dwayne's been working for the city of Spokane for 30 plus years. Well, I've just been at the city for about eight. I've been working in the industry for 30 years. So, so mess up number I one. Wish, I wish it was at the city that long. <laughs> Fair enough. So he's been working in the industry for 30 years. He's going to be talking to you about stormwater treatment and infiltration where you can and where you can't. We'll be talking about contamination, how to handle it, um, interesting and new treatment methods and kind of creative ways to think about a problem. I'm going to be a quick overview and some background on the project. Um, a little bit of the challenges with a few technical and environmental. You guys hear me okay in the back? Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we'll get into the facility itself and the components and how it's laid out, and how it works. And then we'll wrap up with conclusions and lessons learned and all that's the best part, right? So it all kind of started with the Clean Water Act, um, and that's which kind of you know kicked everything off in the seventies. Um, we you know the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System is definitely on the radar for the stormwater. And uh, in the two thousand seven, they had an Urban Waters Initiative um, that I've read about. I wasn't involved in it, but um, they started looking around at uh, things in the impaired rivers and things like that locally. Um, and we want to reduce our, our untreated discharges out there. And uh, the city of Spokane kind of went into a, a logo that called the Cleaner River Faster um, in their clean water plan. And, and they identified some areas they want to get moving on some of this stuff. So the neat thing about this project is, uh, is it was a cooperative uh, approach in a couple of different ways. Uh, one of them was ecology and even had, you know, we talked with ecology about what our path forward was. We wanted to address Spokane River P PCBs that had been detected as part of the uh, the uh, Urban Waters Initiative. And so, does anybody in here tell me what PCBs stand for, or what they are? I mean, not north. Everybody knows what PCBs are. Okay, um, I don't know if you saw that up there, but it's not printed circuit board. <laughs> so I had a little flashy one up there. I couldn't resist. So it's uh, polychlorinated biphenols, and uh, it's usually kind of a pale yellow substance, which I didn't, I wasn't aware of before. But it's often used in transformers. You maybe saw a quick uh, image up there. All the older transformers, new ones don't have it. But um, and then uh, the interesting thing also for me is that it easily penetrates the skin. It's a carcinogen, so uh, that's not exactly a good combination. It also goes through PVC and latex. So. Um, what you think of rubber gloves, maybe you want to get something a little fancier than normal rubber gloves to handle it. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, it was really achieved with uh, partial uh, ecology funding and then uh, private partnerships. Only I'll get into it later, but the, you know, the site itself was a little bit of a trick. So we got to be a little bit innovative with this challenging footprint. <clears throat> so the, uh, the location of the project is kind of the central eastern part of uh, Spokane area there. <clears throat> And this PCB study that happened before uh, found out that this Union Basin uh, in this area here was highest on the, the findings. It kind of traced it back in the river, and this was they sampled some of these colored areas. And that that particular area where we're talking today uh, was pretty was the highest they found. So um, it also coincidentally was a uh, Spokane Transformers there a hundred years ago, or whatever. So that may have contributed, maybe not. <clears throat> Uh, so historically, there's uh, legacy contaminants like PCBs found in this area. And so, uh, you know, reducing the urban runoff discharges, you know, the PCBs and the like, is this going to benefit the whole community, not just the local area there? So <clears throat> this uh, cooperative partnership also involves the landowners. The, there was soils contamination that was found. Um, and there was a private park that was kind of stood out as it's not really got a bunch of buildings and concrete. So it's like, well, maybe we could work it out there, uh, some sort of solution. So we had to kind of balance these different parts of the findings that we're doing to get this thing figured out. And then the river, of course, is right next door, you'll see. So, but this, this is kind of the industrialized area. They've got train tracks. I'll show you some more of that. And there's Centennial Mills in the background. So there's trucks, traffic, all kinds of things going on. Um, <clears throat> So this is the basin basically boundary in that area. It's about 29 acres initially. Um, we kind of had two phases they tried to tackle it in. First, you know, the, the obvious thing is you, you kind of want to start with, you know, maybe some roadside swales might help kind of intercept some of this stuff because uh, I'll show you later, it basically was going straight to the river. 
uh, un unchanged. Um, and then we had another phase of project where we kind of more focused on the end of pipe. Okay, so if you look at that sort of area, the peak here is where they were able to uh, go in and, and use some roadside swales and the yellow is really what was left in the system. So that was about 13 acres left, almost a little under half was left. So um, it kind of looked like this. Uh, they did some uh, you know, curb drops and, uh, and that sort of thing to capture the stormwater in roadside swales there. So um, there's part of the lower end of the basin. You can see there's not a lot of room to put swales and things. It's like they got buildings right up to the property line it's all pavement and asphalt. So, so anyway, that was kind of our first start was phase one. Today, we're going to focus on phase two. Uh, that was the end of pipe part of it. Uh, so really, we're kind of looking at, you know, an open area that we can put something to treat this facility. Um, <clears throat> also, there's a, uh, it also helped make confusion. There's a, a trail, part of the Centennial Trail system that went by here. So they want to continue that system. But basically, what we're talking about is that you know you have your pipes in your storm and catch basins, and we're going straight to the river. So what we wanted to do was intercept that, and so we, we thought, well, we better slow it down if we want to be able to treat it with not something. We don't have a huge site; we have a small site available, and so we thought we'd do some detention, and then we're going to pump it to a swale. So it was the original concept that started, and so you know what that took shape of is, is you got to get a little crafty with that. Um, there's lots of different ways to try to treat this. This is kind of what came out of all the alternative analysis. So there's our site and uh, Union Gospel Mission is right across there. They owned half the site. So half of the Union Gospel, half of the city. So that was part of that private partnership that we wanted to kind of, they, they kind of wanted some more parking and they wanted to control over the driveway. So these were public streets to start off with. And there's a little bit of trading going on where we traded some of the, they let us have some of this land if we vacate those streets. And so it kind of worked out beneficial. There's a lot of duality in this thing, kind of a dual purpose. <clears throat> That's what it looked like when we started. And we tried the best we could to save this big, this is our favorite tree here, but ultimately it wasn't going to be savable or it would be healthy. So we were going to plant other trees elsewhere. So we tried to mitigate that for them. Uh, back a little bit of history, uh, turn of the century of last last century, uh, this thing was uh, a foundry here, St. Louis Brass and Ironworks. So, and then uh, there was also uh, railroads in this area. So they went all through here. They took those out. So those aren't there today. But guess where they put the the parts and pieces of that as they dismantled it? <laughs> as they went into this part area here, they had sort of a bay in here, and that all got filled in. So it was really uncontrolled fill. And there's all kinds of clinkers and all kinds of things. I'll show you a picture. It's not that bad, but it's just not something that you, you normally want to put a bunch of storm water through. So, <clears throat> so anyway, there's back to the railroad. So we did some geotech and, and also some test pits and some environmental. And, uh, and so that we did quite a bit, actually. I mean, if we look at a section through those four there, it kind of looked like this. So there's our site, drops down, there's the river. And guess what? We got groundwater too on top of everything else. So <clears throat> uh, this is fill, fill, fill. You can see down here is native. We found the native was clean. So that was a good thing. Um, but we, the fill is something we got to deal with. <clears throat> so the groundwater, we did some, uh, some, my predecessors were smart enough to say, we need some monitoring wells to kind of figure out what's going on in subsurface. So, you know, you see a few years here of data. This green is the groundwater level. But then that groundwater level really moves a lot. When we started tracking the river, look at the peaks just match right up. So you're close to the river, river, river gravels, alluvials, and it's interchanging uh, the water back and forth. And so what we wanted to be, if you ignore the red for a second, uh, this is sort of our, our proposed storage facility that we were going to attain some of the water. And you can see that the groundwater level, this green, is above our bottom. So we need to pick a window where we can build this thing and not have to pump the aquifer in the river down doing it. So you'll see that there's a coffer dam involved in this project too. Not in a traditional sense with, with uh, sheet piling, but you know, a, for a version of one. So there's some of the test pits. Um, we didn't find any hazardous waste. It was all non-hazardous, metals, heavy oils, PAHs, 
polycy polycyclic ar aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, so inert debris. And uh, so it was pretty limited, but the Navy was clean, like I said. And so when the contractor was working, we had to kind of say, if you, look, you found something that looks funny, let us know because we want to sample it. So, so anyway, if you see there's metal, rusty metal, this dark stuff. We saw a few layers of that. And that's kind of, there's some clinkers in there from the foundry. And they even found a couple other things just for fun. Um, where'd that go? I'll show you later. <laughs> there's a couple, I got a little sample of some of the things they found. I guess that was in the next slide. So anyway, here's our, here's our detention facility pumped to the swale. And, you know, we weren't too happy with what we found underneath. So we're not going to let sperm water just perk like a normal swale. We're going to capture that with a liner. So that serves two purposes, another duality. Uh, it caps the contaminants of that area, that fill. And then it also allows us to capture the treated stormwater and take it somewhere else. So that's what this blue line is. We took it, there's actually adjacent to the site, we found some fairly clean native. It was just because that fill area came shallow. It just wasn't any contaminants there. So bingo, there's our, our infiltration area. <clears throat> okay, so uh, excavation wise, Another factor was there's cultural. It's next to the river. We had to kind of be sensitive to the cultural part of it. Um, so we had uh, the uh, monitoring going on. Uh, underneath the structures, we didn't really want fill and, you know, kind of landfill type of thing, settling these structures and have them settling on us. So we had to go down to native and support these structures somehow. So um, the geosynthetic fabric will be in there. And the big, one of the big things we learned from doing some of these tanks and things in Spooty Spokane was you want to screen your 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 excavation uh, because yeah, there's a pile right here if you can kind of see that. So uh, there's some stockpile of it. Just want to screen it on site because we don't want to pay for to go to landfill or to a hazardous waste landfill with everything. You just want the stuff that's really bad. So the the things that are three inches and bigger weren't considered contaminated. So there was inert debris. So there's some of the things that oh wine bottle I thought was kind of interesting porcelain looking. Uh, and then their old horseshoes, and there was, of course, railroad spikes. Okay, so there's our site. There's the trail it was coming through. Um, there was a big highway project here, a bridge project also going on at the same time. Um, so that added to the staging and everything. It was real fun. We originally wanted to put sort of a, a fun water feature from the pump at the north end, but then when they washed out, came through and said, well, we're going to modify this bridge. We're going to tear that all up. So we went, okay, to heck with that. So you'll see what we ended up with. <clears throat> so basically, I'm going to orient this so it looks like our, our rest of our project. But there's our water coming in, and you'll see how it gets to the swale here. So we got a, <clears throat> I put in a settling manhole because I knew there'd be grit, there'd be these floatables. I didn't really want that going in the pumps and out in the swale, looking like it looked like a park a little bit, you know. <clears throat> so um, this was a five foot uh, deep, eight foot diamond manhole on an 18 inch pipe. So, so it's you know gives it a little bit of, of settling capacity. And it'll be easier to just factor that out and treat that separate. I checked it the other day, and it's only got about six, eight inches over the four years it's been in. So it's not too bad of grit coming in. So it comes in here. So I'll get my little flow arrows. We got pre settling there, goes down. <clears throat> These are slope pipes, slope towards the storage uh, lift station. And then they just fill up. And I got a, a little an extra lesson I throw in there too, verbally. But there's a lift station, and then it pumps to our swale. Okay, the ten-year storm is about nine CFS for this, for this uh, thirteen acres. So <clears throat> uh, we want to pump about and treat about three CFS. So it wasn't like you know cubic feet per second. It wasn't like a ton, but it was you know it wasn't small small potatoes. Uh, there were ten horse pumps, so dual twenty horse pumps. So there's the beginning of our copper dam, and uh, and they were starting to form up the the base slab. And I uh, guess what some of the water came up before they got really far, far along, but they only had to pump against the cracks in the concrete, not the entire aquifer. So they were able to stay ahead of it and it worked out pretty well. Uh, this was just a pipe coming from a couple of catch basins that was in the, the Union Gospel parking lot. And then this is a relief for if everything goes to pieces and the pumps don't work, even though we have dual duplex pumps, there's a way for this to go and this can uh, go to back to the original outfall if everything goes wrong. But we got several safety features to keep that from happening. So this this wet well, uh, we had to seal it because we don't want that concrete 
letting groundwater in and we're pumping onto the swale all the time. So that was another feature. There's also, uh, if you notice, this is oversized base slab for buoyancy. We didn't want this thing to pop out of the ground if the groundwater comes up. And so what we had, you see the glimpses of our 72 inch pipes. I'll show you that. So there's the dual 72 inch pipes. You can walk in them. Uh, they're pretty, pretty fair size. More of it going in. And that's what it looks like inside. <clears throat> a little clean, that's right after we built it, but <clears throat> it isn't too bad. I did look at it the other day and there wasn't any obvious, you know, sludge buildup because there is a little bit of slope, but there is a lesson learned from that. Here's a section view looking along there. Over here's our left station. Here's our pipes. Here's our settling manhole. These are just the clean out manholes for the facility. There's the 10 horse pumps. They're uh, submersible. They can just pull it up and service them. So then you go to this force main. Well, I didn't want it all just to go one place and erode a big hole in the swale. So I slid it out and we created some uh, diffusion structures in here. And th that's how it was an outlet into the swale. But to build a swale, we had to put a 80 mil um, HTPE liner. And there's an under drain system, perf pipe, gravel. So that collects the water that goes through the swale. We covered it with geotech uh, fabric so that we didn't just have a, a total, uh, immediate failure of the biosoil on top. That's sand that they're starting to spread there. And there's the sand all complete. Um, you kind of notice there's an excavator in the background. Um, they started spreading this before they had the final test on the soil. And our construction office was concerned about if we stopped the project that it would cause other change orders. But that actually failed the, the a criteria of two inches per hour that we wanted for a starting infiltration rate. It had plenty of organics and stuff in it. But they ended up having to come in and, and, inf and incorporate some sand and work it in. I was pretty nervous that the underdrain system might get damaged. So lesson learned here is uh, did some infiltration tests to make sure it passed. Um, at least it passed in a few spots that they checked. It's not going to be perfect, though. It's way better if you can stop it from coming if it's not, it's not been you know, sampled properly. Uh, there's the dry one, uh, the uh, under drain. So we were discharging that, the treated water to dry, a drywall gallery, which we didn't want to go deep because it's only you know, 20 feet to the aquifer or 25. So we wanted to use single depth drywalls. So we went an oversized gallery around this big gravel pocket and then our single depth drywalls. And we had to test them, you'll see here in a minute. But if everything else fails, there is some overflow structures that you'll see that if the pumps are stuck on somehow and, and it's frozen and the water's not going anywhere, then it still can get to our infiltration facility. But that's everything above a six month storm typically. <clears throat> so that's what that looked like. It had geotechnical fabric around it. And so there's one of the dry wells. And there's two, uh, two and a half inch uh, hoses on a fire hydrant wide open and it's barely pooling an inch. So it really took a lot of water, it did really well. So it worked out, it took our three CFS that we needed. There's our path, kind of makes it look nice. They wanted a fence on it because people walking on a trail, they didn't want it necessarily to be on the private property. But this curb here is actually the emergency overflow for the swales. Something else goes wrong, a 50 year event happens. We wanted to armor that so that there was a designated place where it could go and not flood out and cause public safety issues. <clears throat> an electric pole down there for the pump controls. I'll show you a quick thing there. I think we're about running out of time here. Um, so one of the things we learned here was our electrical engineer said we need a uh, manual set off switch for these, uh, these pumps near because the pump panel was away. They didn't want it right by the facility. They didn't want it to look, they wouldn't look like a park still kind of. Well, they just put them and there's also lights, by the way. So we have a Cadillac uh, storage facility. You can turn on lights if it's midnight, middle of winter, and something's not working. You can see what the heck you're doing in there. But in order to turn the lights on and shut the pumps off, you see that this is the safety grate uh, up at the rim, and uh, you can't reach those. So another thing is make sure you specify where to put the shutoff switches in your facility. Uh, there's some drone footage. Uh, uh, City has a drone that we are using stormwater in, in our CSO projects. Um, so that's what it looks like uh, just this spring. There's some areas that it's like not perking perfectly. I think that's attributed to that soil wasn't quite the right uh, consistency. You see the, the inlet structures, the three overflows. <clears throat> that's the lift station right there. <clears throat> there actually is park benches along there, so it kind of looks like a park certain times of the year. So there's right after construction. 
And there's, I think last year, what it looked like. So it's staying pretty green, it isn't terrible. Um, at certain times of the summer and it dries out, it's not too bad for a park-like setting. Um, there's a, the structure, oh, it looks like originally, and then here's last year. So we are kind of growing up, uh, but the armoring is still there, so it's not having any erosion problems or anything. And, uh, and that's what it looks like during an event we had last year. So that was almost a one-year storm and it just didn't quite overflow. You see the over overflows are just showing. So, um, so that means it's kind of working, which made me feel good. That's what we're trying to treat is that six month storm. <laughs> so here's what it looks like coming out. I popped a manhole to the drywalls. You kind of seen that pipe, it's pretty clear. So it, it seems to be doing a good job uh, with that. And let's see if I can turn on this quick video. We're almost done here, folks. So that's, that's full speed, full pumps now. Right? I didn't know I'd have the audio on. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. When it's a catch basin running in reverse. So that's the same catch basins you see in the street. It's going to be one of these panels right now. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that's what it looks like. It just kind of distributes out. It wasn't too fast. I was worried about it squirting up crazy or something like that. So it uh, worked out pretty good. I guess after 30 years, you do a little thing or two about pumps and stuff. So that's what it looked like this last winter. And I don't know about the, the, the Union Gospel Mission, but the geese sure seem to like it. <laughs> so basically, that's that's kind of a wrap for it. Um, you want to kind of establish categories for these contaminated areas, screen it. Uh, you want to kind of keep track of if there's groundwater in the area, get your wells in ahead of your project. Uh, and if we want to, you know, don't allow them to bring uh, the, uh, the uh, bio soil on site before it meets your CEC and your infiltration criteria. Be clear about where your electronic controls are supposed to be. And then the nice thing about this is it's really gotten rid of the outfall with the piece, potential for PCBs in the Spokane River. So it's doing its part to, to really make things better. And that's it. <laughs>